So very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you joining. My name is Vishal Vigad and like I say, a very warm welcome on behalf of Arthrex to the first webinar of the Ortho Engage Coffee Room Series. It is my legal obligation to inform all of you that this is currently being recorded and also broadcasted live on YouTube. Subsequently, the recording will be available on arthrex.com. And for those of you joining on our YouTube channel, we'll be aware that the recording will be available there. So let us kick off with a brief introduction to our esteemed international faculty. I'd like to welcome Professor Tennant from the highly reputed St. George's Hospital in London. Professor has really been a true pioneer for ACJ surgical treatment, holding a patent for an arthroscopic technique utilizing suspensory fixation. Also joining us today is Dr. Shresh Gajar from the prestigious Kokilaben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. Dr. Gajar is an arthroscopist and a sports medicine consultant, fellowship trained in the UK on, and Australia. Gentlemen, I thank you both for your time and your contribution today. No doubt today's session will be very informative and engaging. I believe it is extremely fitting to thank all the healthcare practitioners across the globe taking the front line on a daily basis. We thank you for your dedication, compassion, and courage. And we salute you for your sincere efforts as we continue to fight against COVID-19. Before we commence with the first presentation from Dr. Shreyesh Gajar, I want to cover a couple of house rules. You've probably noticed that I've taken the opportunity to mute your lines, and I strongly ask of you to remain muted. And this really is to help create a calm atmosphere that allows no background noise and for people to enjoy the information that is being shared. With regards to your questions and answers, we, you can send your questions forward to orthoengage at gmail.com. Once again, that's orthoengage at gmail.com. And those of you currently joining us via Microsoft Teams, please feel free to use the chat feature to propose your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Shresh Gajar and allow Shresh Gajar to take it further forward. Dr. Gajar, over to you. So whilst Dr. Gajar is just uploading his presentation, again, just a reminder, please put your questions forward to orthoengage at gmail.com. That's orthoengage at gmail.com. And for those of you that join us via Microsoft Teams, please feel free to use the chat option. Thank you. Thank you, Shreyash. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Vishal, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, also, thank you to Arthrex for this excellent educational initiative in these difficult times. And also hello to uh, my co-faculty, Prof. Uh, Duncan Tennant from the UK. So uh, this uh, coffee room uh, session is on AC joint management. And uh, I'll just share my experience with one particular type of uh, implant, which I've been regularly using over the last seven to eight years. So historically, we know that uh, surgical management of AC joint injuries, especially the chronic ones, has been challenging with varying degrees of outcomes. And this has resulted in a large number of newer emerging techniques, but still we haven't had a gold standard. In the last decade, what this has led to is revisiting the anatomy by a series of cadaveric studies, which are focused mainly on the acromioclavicular joint. And from these studies, we now recognize that the AC joint ligament plays a very important role in uh, AP and rotational stability, 
and it has two components a very uh, prominent uh, a superior to posterior band and a small uh, anterior inferior band which is present in around 42% of people whereas this superior posterior band is present in almost everyone also in the biomechanical studies conducted in the last decade uh, we have done sectioning of the ac ligament to try and assess the biomechanics in terms of stability and what has been noted is that the ac joint plays a very important role in horizontal or ap stability and also in posterior rotational stability and from these anatomic and biomechanical studies we have realized that in our surgical techniques we need to include an additional procedure to stabilize the ac joint in an anterior posterior plane these studies have also led us to revisit the rockwood classification and we know that uh, grade 1 2 and most grade 3 tend to be treated non operatively whereas grade 4 5 and 6 are candidates for surgery the isacos upper extremity committee in 2014 published this scientific committee report where they have sub classified the type 3 injuries based on the knowledge acquired in the last decade from anatomic and biomechanical studies into grade 3a where there is only a vertical component of displacement and grade 3b where there is a horizontal instability as you can see in the axillary radiograph here so this is an important recognition when we manage uh, these injuries so after all these background work that has been done in the last decade if you look at surgical management uh, in the 2020 it is not just about reconstructing the coracoclavicular ligaments uh, which we do and i use the dock button uh, technique i find this very reliable reproducible and simple it offers a very strong construct uh, than the earlier generation technique and also we need to include an anterior posterior stabilization of the ac joint and for that the internal brace concept which has been applied to other areas comes very handy and this will ensure that we can address this component which we didn't uh, over the last uh, several years so this is a case example a 25 year old athlete Uh, who was involved in uh, injury to his dominant right shoulder playing cricket and he presented to me after 2 weeks after having seen a local orthopedic surgeon the place where i work is a tertiary referral center so a lot of these injuries are referred subsequently uh, for management so this was his uh, appearance there was a prominent uh, ac joint on his right dominant side when we took his radiographs Uh, the ap view which confirmed that there is uh, displacement but more importantly in these situations uh, i would recommend to do a cross adduction view because that would determine whether this is a 3a or a 3b type of an injury and this uh, uh, cross adduction scapular lateral view confirms that it is a 3b type of injury and taking into account the activity level the age uh, and the uh, nature of the injury the surgical management was offered to this patient to which he agreed and uh, i do all my uh, coracoclavicular uh, repair with the uh, dog arthroscopic method typically uh, it is a beach chair position which i use for all my shoulder arthroscopic surgeries under fluoroscopic guidance surface anatomy uh, for any kind of shoulder surgery is very important one needs to mark out the acromion the clavicle the coracoid the standard posterior viewing portal is used initially to conduct a diagnostic round subsequently an anterior superior lateral portal is created which becomes the viewing portal when we expose the coracoid and perform the fixation a low anterior portal is important for instrumentation and i would recommend that this is made into a slightly larger Uh, portal because we need to pass the implant and the uh, accompanying suture through that another important thing to note is that roughly uh, it has been shown from studies that 
the conoid and the trapezoid. This is a view of the undersurface of the clavicle, and it is seen that the conoid and the trapezoid are at different distances from the uh, lateral uh, joint line of the clavicle. And if you want to create a single bundle technique, which is what this dog bone button involves, then you need to aim for the midpoint, just like how we do our uh, single bundle anatomic ACL reconstructions. And that point is typically 30 millimeters. So that is more or less the surface anatomy, which I mark out uh, when I'm performing this type of surgery. Now, the Arthrex AC joint dog button kit comes very handy to perform this procedure. Uh, it comprises of a three millimeter cannulated drill bit through which you can pass the nitinol wire. So there is no need to pass in a guide pin first and then drill over it. It reduces the number of steps. The nitinol wire is then uh, shuttled out and the coracoid dog bone button, which has a pre-attached dog button along with uh, the fiber and tiger tape sutures uh, are used. And the, the beauty of this kit is that the ends of this uh, coracoid dog bone button suture is merged so that you don't have too many sutures to pass through this three millimeter hole within the coracoid and the clavicle. And subsequently towards the end, when you're reducing the AC joint, the clavicle dog bone button has to be placed. And this is the surgical technique which I'll talk you through. So right shoulder, beach chair position, a diagnostic round, around 20 to 40% of associated glenohumeral injuries have been noted with AC joints. So it's important to uh, have a diagnostic round or if necessary, do a preoperative MRI if you're going to do an open type of surgery. So in this particular patient, uh, there was no associated uh, glenohumeral joint uh, injury, as you can uh, note from the diagnostic uh, look. So we proceeded to our preparation of the coracoid. The first step is important that you have to release the rotator interval adequately for visualization. Posteriorly, the labrum was intact. Now I'm looking through the anterior superior portal and working through the low anterior portal. And with the radio frequency device, I've exposed the coracoid. I will now use the uh, probe to determine the lateral and then the medial edge of the coracoid because I have to aim for the center. Arthrex has a dedicated anatomic jig, as you can see here, and it is centered over the base because it has a very wide area and a strong purchase of bone. So uh, I tend to hold the jig and drill and my assistant holds the camera. So you can see that, and as we're drilling through, we need to make sure that we are approximately three centimeters from the AC joint line. And now you can slowly see the drill bit coming into view. Uh, there it is. And uh, you can also see that I had tried one attempt earlier, but it was very close to the body of the scapula, so I abandoned it. But one should avoid repeated attempts uh, to make sure that uh, you, know, you don't uh, fracture the coracoid. So here the drill bit, uh, is being advanced and then a nitinol wire is shuttled across and through the low anterior portal I will grasp the nitinol wire. One important feature is to withdraw the uh, cannulated drill a little to allow the uh, passage of wire smoothly as you can see here and once that is done the drill bit is removed and then through this low anterior portal the uh, coracoid part of the dog bone button along with the fiber and tiger tape sutures are passed in a retrograde manner. They are shuttled across. As you can see here. And then subsequently I pull on the coracoid side and then I hold the uh, coracoid button with a grasper and make sure that it sits properly with the coracoid. Another important aspect is that the laser mark on the button should be along the long axis of the coracoid because this contours the button very well to allow for nice uh, compression and reduction of the AC joint. So that more or less completes the glenohumeral or the arthroscopic part of the procedure. And then I move on to the clavicular side and I pass the button through the fiber and tiger tapes and then simply tie the knots. Uh, but it's very important at this step to reduce the AC joint, and I would emphasize that to try and over-reduce it 
because subsequently in the x-ray we tend to see one or two millimeters of you know vertical subluxation so over reduce and then tighten the knot on the clavicular button thereafter in this patient because he had a grade 3b injury i extended the clavicular incision as you can see here and i have uh, made the internal brace as the figure of 8 configuration so you can see the just for orientation this is the anterior part this is the posterior part this is the lateral end of the clavicle this is the acromion and these are the sutures going through and it has been tied like a knot to give this figure of 8 configuration there are other configurations like the box the speed fix type or just the anterior internal brace but the figure of 8 has shown to be much more uh, reproducible and reliable to try and eliminate the ap and rotational stabil instability so this is the post op x ray of that patient you can see the dog button in place it's very important that it is 3 cm lateral to the uh, ac joint line to prep, you know to ensure that the trajectory is vertical also you can see the drill marks of the internal brace uh, which has been passed again we have to be precise with the tunnels to prevent any kind of fracture or blow out so this is the patient uh, post operatively you can see that the deformity is reduced so i would like to say certain tips and tricks while performing this procedure predominantly or preferably the arthroscopic technique should be done within 3 to 4 weeks of the injury uh, because the reducibility of the ac joint is easier however having said that having used this implant over the last 7 to 8 years i have done it in chronic cases as well and i will sh show some examples sub in my subsequent slides it's also very important to adequately clear the rotator interval for proper visualization and also to ensure that there is no soft tissue impingement while passage of the coracoid dog bone button and the fiber and the tiger tape sutures it is also important to remember and recognize the anatomy of the coracoid and the clavicle so these two photographs highlight that the coracoid is broadest around 25 mm at the base and this is the area where we need to have a fixation of the button if we tend to go anteriorly we may not be able to reduce the ac joint properly and also we might end up fracturing the coracoid as far as the clavicle goes as cited in this x ray you've seen that the coracoid the clavicular tunnel i beg your pardon has been too lateral and therefore the button has migrated and the reduction is lost and it's very important that we get the correct trajectory which is typically around 3 cm uh, medial to the uh, ac joint line another important aspect uh, is to uh, make sure that we reduce or slightly over reduce the ac joint before tightening the clavicular dog bone button to prevent that slight subluxation seen in the subsequent x rays also one needs to exercise caution while doing the internal brace and drilling the tunnels to prevent any blow out and prevent multiple attempts at drilling and another important point is to ensure that you bury these fiber wire a uh, fiber tape and tiger tape sutures underneath the clavi trapezoidal fascia so that there is no irritation or not related problems in the future and to say the least adequate rehabilitation and patient compliance is extremely important to manage this challenging injury which has not shown the best of results over the years so having played around with this implant over the last 7 to 8 years i have extended my indications and this is one such example a 55 year old lady who sustained a road traffic accident one year ago and associated rib fractures this uh, she had a lateral and clavicle fracture for some reason unknown the injury was treated non operatively she presented to me a year later with pain and limitation especially in overhead shoulder movements and rotation so i performed this uh, dog button technique through an arthroscopic approach again i wouldn't emphasize that everyone needs to do it arthroscopically what is important that you technically do the procedure correctly to minimize any risk of potential complications but certainly uh, in the capable hands and with the necessary skills it would be good to do the uh, coracoid preparation and the fixation through an arthroscopic approach and then i had to reduce so i didn't uh, at one year there was 
as you can see on the pre-op x-ray, there was hardly any clavicle remnant left. It was all resorbed. So I'd use the remnant of the medial end of the clavicle to the acromion and perform this figure of eight type of internal brace technique. And you can see the dog button, which is lying medially to this uh, AC joint. And this was our x-ray. You can appreciate that the clavicle is nicely reduced and also the AC joint component is also aligned. And uh, this is her uh, function at a year uh, post-op. She has full range of motion. We've operated on her left uh, shoulder. This is her forward flexion. These are her rotations. And also the internal rotation, as you can see there. So very good outcome for this complex problem. Also, I've extended the indications for lateral and clavicle fracture. As you can appreciate, this is a comminuted fracture with a very small uh, lateral piece. So any kind of plate and screw fixation would be very challenging. Also, uh, fixing pa or passing screws through this wafer-like inferior fragment would be challenging. Uh, and there is an associated injury to the CC joint resulting in the displacement. So if we apply the principle and knowledge and we've just reduced that uh, CC joint component, as you can see here, then you can ensure that you can uh, ensure a very good outcome. And the, this clavicular fracture has healed in four months' time. And clearly, this technology would avoid use of uh, the old-fashioned devices like the hook plate, which, uh, apart from being bulky, also involves a second surgery subsequently for its removal. On the other hand, Arthrex in their portfolio also have a clavicular plate. If the, the lateral fragment is of reasonable size, so you can fix it with plates and screws and incorporate the dog button suspensory kind of device within the hole of the plate. So a lot of versatility and options for different uh, levels of pathology. So when I treat uh, AC joint injuries, I follow this very simple and useful algorithm Typically, for the grade 1 and 2, they get pr primary non-operative treatment. The type 3 and the 4 and 6 will get operative treatment if the patient or the candidate is an athlete involved in high manual labor work or is high demanding. If none of these are there or if it's a 3A type of injury, then I would initially resort to non-operative treatment. If it is successful, they return to activity after 3 months phased return, but if not, then I would go in for a secondary operative line of management. So this algorithm is very useful when dealing with this challenging injury. So in summary, in an acute presentation, which is typically three to four weeks down the line, my choice of treatment would be to do the CC joint fixation using the dog bone button suspensory device and to reduce and treat the AC joint component with this figure of eight internal bracing. On the other hand, in a chronic presentation, in addition to what I've done for the acute cases, I would add in a soft tissue graft to add biology and to increase the potential for healing and also to add further stability. So, however, uh, data as far as the management of this injury is quite uh, scarce. And there is limited evidence because historically we used to do non-anatomic procedures and now we have recognized and moved to anatomic procedures. So currently still the data and evidence is still not enough for us to refute or you know, to oppose a particular line of treatment. So in summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, uh, what has been known in the last decade is there is tremendous motion at the AC joint irrespective of the extent of damage to the conventional CC ligaments. Horizontal instability is a major factor leading to clinical failure, and hence anatomic repair involving both the AC and the CC ligaments remains vital. Anterior and posterior rotation at the AC joint is significant, and biomechanical studies have shown that despite adding uh, the additional fixation on the AC joint, there is still some amount of residual posterior rotation, and therefore the reductions are still slightly weaker, but much better than before, uh, and therefore we are still looking for a gold standard. Importantly, the use of the internal brace, 
the dog bone button reconstruction technique offers a simple, reproducible, and a minimally invasive anatomic uh, approach for the management of acute cases. An additional augmentation with a soft tissue graft would be my, uh, recommended as per the evidence-based literature for the chronic cases. I thank you very much for your attention and wish you to stay safe and stay strong. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Shreyash. That was a fantastic presentation with some excellent clinical cases there. So we've had a couple of questions come across. Um, so the first question, um, I, the name I see it as is Spiros, is how can you ensure optimal reduction in the anterior-posterior axis? It happens sometimes to have a good reduction in one axis, vertical, up and down, and not in the anterior-posterior. So I'm assuming this is relating to the internal brace that you discussed. Right. So uh, when we are dealing with grade three injuries and about, we are anyway doing a mini open type of procedure. So in that mini open procedure, you have the lateral end of the clavicle and the adjoining part of the acromion exposed. So it is very easy to try and reduce it. In the chronic cases, there has been a recommendation to excise a lateral end of the clavicle by say around five millimeters if the joint is not being reduced but biomechanically this has shown to cause a little bit increase in AP joint instability so if possible one should try and avoid a resection of the lateral end of clavicle but in short to answer this question it's a mini open approach so you are able to visualize the joint from front to back and you can ensure it to be reduced. Excellent. Um, I'm also going to ask uh, Duncan Tennant to come in there, Professor, um, if you could kindly join us and if you could just switch on your camera so yeah, we can see. Yeah, hopefully you can, uh, can hear me. Um, Brilliant. I yeah. The, the danger with doing this arthroscopically is that there's a temptation to do it arthroscopically because it's fun and it looks good, but you don't get a clear shot at the actual AC joint itself. You can't see what you're doing. So you do have to be very, very careful if you do it arthroscopically uh, to get that right. One trick you can do is to place your drill hole in the clavicle slightly posterior in the clavicle so that the, the suture is angled forward uh, into the coracoid. That will draw the clavicle anteriorly. And because of the attachment to the tissues anteriorly, they will not over-reduce anteriorly and you'll line it up better, but ideally you need to have a good look. And this is probably a mistake we made when we first started doing these arthroscopically, was not to appreciate exactly how well we were doing with the AC joint. Uh, fantastic. That's some great advice there. I think the next question we had coming in was actually specific to that. So any significant difference between arthroscopic and open techniques? And really, let's, let's start with um, yourself, Professor. Uh, your opinion? Is there a significant um, difference? Well, when we started, I reference it more to tightrope than, uh, than dog bone, but it, it pretty well applies to both. When we started this back in 2004, it was all arthroscopic because it was terribly clever, and that was what we decided to do. More and more, I've moved to doing these open as a formal open operation, partly because it's quicker. By the time you've got the scope set up and all the equipment and you've done the debridement and all the rest of it, you could have finished an open operation. It takes 20 minutes open. Um, a lot of our acute AC joints and lateral clavicle fractures, as you're actually saying, um, they're done by the trauma surgeons, who I don't let loose with an arthroscope because they just break it. So we've taught them how to do an open technique. Uh, I've got some pictures on my my presentation on how to do it. It is much easier to do. It means you know you've got the joint reduced. Certainly with the clavicle fractures, you can see that you've got the fracture reduced. You can put a little circlage around it. Uh, so it's easier. It, it's quicker. It's cheaper. Um, and it doesn't need an arthroscopic surgeon. So that's I've, I've tended to move towards the arthroscopic, to the open, even though we describe the arthroscopic technique and uh, publish that. Yeah. Excellent. And then I've got another question coming through from Dr. Webster um, from South Africa. And this goes to both yourself and Shreyash. 
Um, Suresh, any experience with using synthetic ligament, uh, ligament sorry, for chronic repair instead of a ligament graft? Right. So when I was in the UK, uh, in my years of training, I did see the uh, last ligament being used. But uh, we have no experience uh, since I have moved back to India. Also, the concern with the last is uh, that there is a fracture or breakage of the neoligament. So, in particular, I don't have any experience uh, with the synthetic ligament. I would prefer to use a soft tissue autograft. Again, allografts in India can be challenging. So, I would consent and use an autograft should the need arise. Okay. The same question to you, Prof. Um, any experience with using synthetic grafts? Um, for chronic uh, repair? I have put a couple in and they've worked. I've taken a fair few out that come to me for a second opinion. And when it works, I think it's great. It's very quick, very reliable. It's very strong. When they fail, not only do you get a fracture of the clavicle or the coracoid or both, but it actually erodes through. And I've had patients where they've had a centimetre of clavicle missing. So you've then got an unstable AC joint. Wow, yeah. Effectively, you're missing the last couple of centimetres of your clavicle, or you've got a centimetre missing through your coracoid, and it's a disaster to try to reconstruct that. So I, I'm, I always look at these things and go, what happens if they fail? What is my out? And an out mm. from a neo is very, very difficult. So I don't use them. Mm. Um. Uh, Prof, just whilst we're addressing some of these questions, if we could just ask you to upload your presentation in the meantime, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So do you, uh, here's a question from Dr. Hashim Barcelona. Um, do you use a graph for horizontal stabilization with a vertical graph for chronic ACJ lesions? Shresh? Sorry, Vish, can you just repeat that, please? Sure. Do you use a graph? for horizontal stabilization with a vertical graph for chronic ACJ? Right. So as I had shown in my slides, so if it's a chronic uh, ACJ, then in addition to using the dog button for the CC part of the repair and the internal brace for the AC joint, I would augment it uh, with the soft tissue graft. The reason being that it's a uh, uh, environment where the healing potential is weak. So uh, adding biology and typically an autograph would help it. Although having said that, studies have shown that uh, in terms of the biomechanical strength, the construct of the dog bone button uh, in uh, combination with an internal brace is equivalent to using just the soft tissue graft uh, for the coracoclavicular uh, side. Uh, so, you know, that tends to be my uh, management. Sure. And, and Dr. Gajar, do you tend to implement a internal brace for all your type 3, type 4, type 5, type 6? Um, you know, what, what, is your, what is your criteria for when you're wanting to implement or implant an internal brace for ACJ? So uh, when it comes to uh, grade 4 to 6, there is no uh, debate on that. I always, uh, almost always do that. When we talk about the grade 3s, the 3B, certainly I will. The 3As, uh, depending on my reducibility, I may or may not. But if it is an overhead athlete, then uh, having, you know, having uh, analyzed all the literature and the concerns over the last uh, decade, I would certainly not hesitate to add the internal brace component to my AC joint repair. Fantastic. One more question. Um, uh, sorry, we've actually got time for a few more questions. Do you still utilize a modified weaver done in chronic cases? And that's from Dr. Sufyan. Right. Very good question. But uh, if you look at uh, the literature in peer review journals, the weaver done technique in terms of the biomechanical strength is much weaker uh, when compared to a suspensory type of fixation or a soft tissue graft for the CC uh, side repair. So Weaver Dunn is, or modified Weaver Dunn is typically out. Also, the, the extent of healing is also shown to be much inferior than the other two options, which I just mentioned. So modified Weaver or Weaver Dunn was done earlier where we didn't have these strong devices and other options. And we have learned over the years that they no longer work. So it is about time to move on to these uh, newer techniques. If I can just, can you hear me still? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, um, Professor. Go ahead. Chip in at that point with the uh, modified weaver done. It depends on what you mean by modified. What we do is use a tightrope uh, as your temporary, effectively, fixation. Uh, and your reduction, and then use the CA ligament uh, as your biological graft. And yes, I accept that initially that graft is not as strong as, say, a hamstring or an allograft, but nobody's asking these people to lift weights on day one. And we know that uh, an ACL allograft has no strength at 12 weeks, but will get stronger. And the uh, CA ligament has a blood supply, it is vascular, it is a living piece of tissue. So we've been doing, uh, in our department, what one would call a modified weaver done, so using the CA ligament and using a tightrope. Uh, we've been doing that now for 15 years, and I think I've had two failures, and they're both traumatic. So it has great advantages, and it's all local. You're not harvesting hamstring, you're not putting in an allograft. Um, you get a very, very strong, very stable fixation, Rehab, yeah, they all get four weeks in a sling. I saw somebody posted a question about rehab. For yeah. me, they all get four weeks in a sling. They're not doing any heavy and overhead lifting till three months, and they're not doing contact, contact sports for six months. But that's part of their overall rehab, regardless of what you use. So I wouldn't dismiss, yeah. I wouldn't dismiss Weaver done. I think you just have to think about what you're doing. I agree, just transferring the CA ligament and nothing else, that's not strong enough. Uh, thank you very much for addressing that question. Yeah, it's up to, popped up a couple of times now uh, in terms of rehab protocol. And, and gentlemen, does that differ much when we talk about um, implanting an internal brace? Uh, or does it differ at all from your rehab protocol for an isolated ACJ reconstruction, just addressing that superior migration? Sorry, should I go first? Yes, does, thank you. Does, does your um, protocol so differ? No, I, I don't think the message here uh, is uh, to, if I may, just divert from your question, Wish, as uh, Prof. Duncan Tennant said, that you don't hesitate to do an open procedure to minimize the risks of mistakes and complications. And secondly, you don't go fast on the rehab irrespective of the technology you use because this, the management of this joint because of the forces is challenging. And typically what he said is what I would follow and contact sports or any kind of sports is only at six months. So slow, slow, and slow. Okay. Um, Duncan, um, uh, any input from you on that front? And does it differ in any way when you've put in a, uh, an internal brace? No. I, to my mind, all of these things are effectively temporary fixation. Uh, and you're waiting for biology to do its thing. And all you're doing with a, an internal brace is trying to stabilize that uh, AC joint in a different plane. Uh, you're still waiting for biological healing. If you just put in, and I say this to people over and over again about tightrope, if you're just putting in a piece of string, ultimately it's going to fail. Uh, if you don't get sure. biological healing, it's not going to work. So it it, the, the act of putting in a brace, uh, to me, doesn't change anything in my terms of my own. No, 100%. Um, so we have another question from Dr. Mishani, uh, I believe from the UAE. It says, I come across a number of these injuries amongst professional cyclists in the UAE. I don't routinely do MRI, but do do diagnostic arthroscopy and find acute changes in the labrum, biceps or cuff pathology. What is your experience of the above findings and what do you do? Repair at the same time? If so, do you recommend arthroscopy as a gold standard or do you do an AC joint either arthroscopically or open. Uh, um, right. Just tackle so, that one first. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please, uh, Duncan. My experience is that you you do see lots of minor injuries. Um, you know, potential labral tears, partial thickness cuff tears, slap lesions. Most of them are clinically irrelevant. Um, we have not, and I looked at my first cohort. Uh, where we just picked the ACJ, um, first 50 or so, we did not touch any other pathology and said we'd come back to it if we needed to, not once if we had to come back and actually do anything. And if you think of your professional cyclists, that they've got a pasta lesion or a slap lesion 
or a label tear that is not going to change their ability to be a professional cyclist. So I leave them and treat them if they need to, and I treat very, very few. Uh, and I think the danger, one of the risks we haven't talked about here, is stiffness. The risk of frozen mm -hmm. shoulder is not insignificant with this operation if you do it arthroscopically, uh, because you take out the rotator interval and it scars. So I, would, I personally don't fix anything else at the same time. So I, I'm not worried. I don't even get them an MRI now. I'll deal with it if we come back for it. Yeah, sure. Shresh, your experience? Uh, uh, just a slight uh, uh, differing opinion there. So if you look at literature, up from 20 to 40% of associated glenohumeral injuries are noted, and they do advocate doing an MRI. Uh, I would say especially if you're going to do it open because you don't get an opportunity to look into the glenohumeral joint. But each injury, whether it's uh, articular-sided cuff tear or a superior labral tear, for example, needs to be dealt with by merit. And yes, obviously, there is a concern of stiffness. But um, I, I mean, my view is that uh, we, in this young population, uh, they're, they are, these are associated injuries, and we really need to fix it there and then uh, rather than to come back at a later date. So it, 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 is, uh, 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 it is not uh, one rule fits all or uh, one size fits all. It is uh, dependent on the, the nature and the extent of the associated injury. Okay. Um, gentlemen, we're going to take one more question before we carry on with um, Professor Tennant's presentation. So when doing an ACJ in an open manner, one of the challenges um, that is faced is a lot of time in retrieving and passing the wire from under the coracoid. Any tips and tricks to make this quicker and easier? And this comes from Rowan from Kenya. Um, well, I'll address doing that in the open technique using a tightrope uh, in my talk. Um, so don't know if okay. you've got anything to say about trying to retrieve the dog bone. Shresh? Uh, I must confess that um, right or wrongly, I, I do it all arthroscopic. So this uh, problem I don't really encounter. But having said that, uh, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Arthrex has a dedicated uh, suture passer, especially for these graphs and other things. So you have instruments where you Sorry. can use it as a circlage and help you pass it. And the, 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 I think the, the principle is that you dilate the track so that, you know, you can ensure that there is no uh, impingement uh, for passage, really. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. That's 100% right. We do have dedicated instruments, especially for those chronic cases where you're wanting to pass graph, etc. Um, okay, guys, uh, should we hand over to Professor Tennant now? Um, and then we can, again, take pick up with the questions. There's a lot coming through, and we'll have plenty of time to address them following the presentation. Thank you, Professor. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, evening, whatever time it is with you. Uh, greetings from London, where we are in lockdown, and I'm I'm working, but I can get away for an hour. Um, so what we're going to talk about is ACJ tightrope, a little bit of the anatomy classification, which we've covered. Uh, I'm going to go through the arthroscopic technique and the open technique, uh, and then we'll talk about the acromioclavicular ligaments, uh, a little bit of the anatomy uh, reconstruction, and then we'll just talk about a couple of cases. Um, we've already talked about which ones we treat. Um, and certainly, as we know, the grade one, the grade two, and the grade three, the minor grade threes, um, I wouldn't touch. Um, whether it's a 3B or a 4, uh, I think is open to debate. Um, but certainly when you start to get AP or rotatory instability, uh, then you need to start looking at those. The grade five, I don't think anybody debates. And grade six is not an AC joint dislocation. It's actually part of a shoulder disarticulation. Very high incidence of scapular fractures, vascular injuries, uh, and brachial plexus injuries. And the last one I saw, uh, we ended up doing a four-quarter amputation. Uh, so they're, they're not really the same beast. Why do we do it? Well, we, we sort of know a lot of this anyway. We know it's the scapular suspension, and therefore patients, uh, it's all about the scapular kinematic, uh, kinematics, thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, and then an impingement. Now, for some people, it doesn't matter if you've got the cyclists, the rugby players, they often don't really care. 
it doesn't bother them in their sports. But any overhead athletes, and I work just around the corner from Wimbledon, so a lot of tennis players, uh, they don't like the loss of control at the higher range. So we tend to treat those. Um, we've talked about the anatomy uh, briefly. And just to remind you of the uh, relationship of the ligaments to uh, the end of the clavicle, but really they are very, very close uh, to the end of the clavicle. So people talk about doing routine distal clavicle re re resections. And when we first started doing these back in 2004, the thinking was you always had to do an AC joint resection. Uh, the answer is you don't. And if you do, you run risk of upsetting the AC joint itself. So the principle here with acute injuries is to reduce it and hold it, wait for biological healing. Um, and we've got a number of options that we've already talked about, and I'm just going to talk about uh, the type rope side of things. There are other options out there, but I really don't think that any of the things you can see uh, are current. Uh, the hook plate, I really don't think has a place any more, apart from some very specific injuries. I did put one in six months ago, uh, but that was a, uh, basically it was a coracoid fracture, and so the whole of the suspensory mechanism had come away. Um, and the idea of using some form of screw, uh, they do still do them in France, um, and every one that I've seen come back from France, I've then had to redo as they've managed to miss the coracoid. So I think that really should be historical. So what is the tightrope? Uh, well, it's gone through a number of iterations. Uh, I first developed it for the AC joint in 2004. Um, we now have a 10 millimeter clavicle button. The subcoracoid button is 13 millimeters long by 3.4 wide. Four strands of a number five uh, Kevlar, basically a fiber wire suture, and some pretty simple uh, instrumentation. And again, there are a number of different jigs you can use. Uh, you find one that works for you. Uh, as an individual. So it's been around now. We put the first ones in in 2004. It came onto the market in about 2006 um, as an arthroscopic technique uh, and as an augment for chronics. We published on our first 24 cases in 2008, two year follow up, uh, demonstrating that it was reliable, uh, that it was safe, uh, and we got good. Uh, constant scores, Oxford scores as outcomes. Uh, but you'll see this box in a number of these slides. Uh, it is for acute injuries only. We are waiting for biological healing. And I've been asked over the years, what happens if you put it in at six months? And I can tell you it will fail. So this is a video of the uh, technique. Uh, it's a slightly older video, um, but it gives you the idea. So we're looking here at grade five dislocation. Uh, as you heard, you debride the uh, rotator interval, but as I've gone on, I've done less and less debridement of the interval. I don't put cannulae anymore. Uh, I do it all percutaneously. And then you bring the jig in, now, whether you bring it in through a uh, cannula or not, after you've exposed the base. And as Suresh was saying, you've really got to clear it. You've got to know where you are medially. Laterally, you want to be right down uh, in the neck there, because that's where the good bone is. Bringing the jig in, you've got to be very, very careful that you're in the right place on the clavicle and you're in the right place on the coracoid. I personally prefer this older jig, but that's just personal preference. But you need to be in the right place because you only really get one pass. If you do more than one pass, you're in trouble. So with the AC tightrope, it's a guide pin cannulated reamer that goes over the top. You then take the guide pin out. And you pass it, I like the rigid nitinol wire, and you pass that down and grasp it through the uh, anterior inferior portal. You then load the tight rope. So here it comes, pull it through. You then take the reamer off. This has to be done manually. If you put the drill on, you'll damage the little loop at the top. Pass the sutures through the loop. You then pull the uh, subcoracoid button through. It flips. You sometimes have to do a little trick to get it around the corner. Um, 
and you can either give a tug on one of the sutures or you put the grasper in at this point and you can just put it around the corner. You lie it flat and transverse. And then as you saw before, uh, you just tie down, you cinch it down. So you pull one limb, then the other. You keep pulling uh, until the clavicle is reduced and then you can tie it off. And the tip here is to leave those tails quite long, about three quarters of a centimetre, and then you can bury them in the soft tissues quite nicely. So that's the arthroscopic technique. It requires a certain degree of skill uh, with an arthroscope uh, and some equipment. So this is what we taught our trauma surgeons to do. If you make an incision just below the clavicle, uh, and if you make this uh, longitudinal incision, it enables you to get to the AC joint if you want to do that. Uh, you then go straight down onto the clavicle itself and you make a T incision in the fascia over the clavicle uh, and then down to split the deltoid muscle just for a centimetre or so. All you need to do is be able to see the top of the coracoid. And you put a couple of, uh, we call them a trithaum bone spike, in one either side of the clavicle uh, just to keep the soft tissues out of the way and it demarcates the top of the clavicle. And this is a, these pictures are actually from demonstrating you can do this for the lateral clavicle fracture, but the technique's the same. If you take your 3.5 millimeter drill, you drill through the clavicle in one hole, separately drill through the coracoid. And people often ask, is it safe to drill through the coracoid blind? The answer is it's completely safe as you've got about three centimeters under there, as you saw from the arthroscopic videos, about three centimeters before the nerves appear. So unless you're incredibly clumsy, you don't have a problem. So two separate holes. You then use the nitinol wire to pass your uh, button through the clavicle in one step. Now you take the, the button and you'll notice it's got a little dimple on one end. And if you push the button into the coracoid hole, and then you can either use the knot pusher, or the other trick is to take the drill bit, put the drill bit in the dimple, line it up, and then give it a good hard tap with a mallet, and it will pop through uh, to sit on the other side of the coracoid. And then all you have to do is to pull on the sutures, it'll flip, and then you reduce everything. So that's the easy way of doing it open. You don't need to retrieve anything from underneath the coracoid. You don't need to see the underside of the coracoid. Everything's done for you. So that's the open technique. And you can do it through a plate if you've got a lateral clavicle fracture. Uh, some of them will, don't need a plate, some of them do. Very, very simple technique. Takes about 20 minutes. It's what we teach all our residents and our trauma surgeons to do. <clears throat> There are some criticisms of the tightrope. Uh, the holes are 3.8 millimetres. Um, it's fibre wire, could be stronger, and you have a knot on the top. So they're all valid criticisms. I think if you make one 3.8 millimetre hole, it's not a problem. If you make more than one, you're in deep trouble. Fibre wire is plenty strong enough if you've done the operation properly. And yes, the superior knot is a problem, but you have that with all the other techniques as well. If we just look at the AC joint itself now, um, as we've just heard, we've become more aware over the last few years of the anatomy. We sort of, we sort of ignored when I started doing these. Uh, and we know that this is uh, posterior superior ligament that's probably the most important part. And the number of studies have shown that if you sequentially section these ligaments, uh, the resistance to either rotation or translation uh, goes down. Now, it doesn't really make any difference which order you section them in. The net result, when they've all gone, uh, is that you've got less than 10% of the resistance to movement that you had originally. So, as you've heard, there are a number of different ways of uh, stabilising it. The traditional internal brace uh, uses a couple of little swivel lock anchors and fibre tape across the front. That will stop posterior translation. 
won't particularly stop anterior and doesn't do an awful lot for rotatory control. The other problem is that you're trying to put a fairly decent sized anchor into either the acromion uh, or the clavicle. Uh, so it's not an operation that I've been terribly keen on. Uh, another technique has been described is the RICO bridge as an arthroscopic assisted technique. Basically what you do is you bring the arthroscope into the subacromial bursa, drill a couple of holes through the uh, acromion. And if you look on picture B, you can see it's the acromion on the right and the, the two sutures coming out. So you have to then retrieve sutures out through the acromion. You drill a hole through the clavicle and then you tie it down to make a sort of an X shape, but it comes out as more of a Y, really. Um, it's a technique. Nothing's really been done on the biomechanics of it. Uh, Sire and Imhoff uh, did some work on the different reconstruction techniques. Uh, and what they showed was that if you start to section the ligaments, you get a lot more movement. And if you only do a reconstruction, as you can see there in the uh, third column, you still don't control the uh, AC joint. But if you do this technique that you can see in the picture on the left, which is a, a cross technique, but also a suture across the front and a suture across the back, uh, you get much closer to the native stabilization. And this is where I think we're probably going to need to go in the future. But they didn't interest me on this one, although rotatory is supposed to be an issue, they didn't measure rotation. So I'll just show you the technique that, uh, that I've been using for a while, uh, that we're doing the biomechanics on. And this uses the 1.6 millimeter fiber tack anchor, which I don't know if you have, but it's, uh, it's used for stabilization. It comes with either a straight or a curved drill. Uh, and you put an anchor in the front of the acromion, uh, just by the joint, and you put another one in the back of the acromion. And I started doing it on the top, and now put it behind the clavicle going through the acromion, so not top to bottom, but medial to lateral, so the anchor is buried inside the bone. Then make a little drill hole in the lateral clavicle, just like we saw with the Rico bridge. You then take one limb, pass it across the top, the other limb, uh, around either the back or the front, depending on where you are, and then you can pull them down uh, and tie them together. So this thing gives you stability, both AP and controls the rotation, both uh, posteriorly and anteriorly. And just to give you an idea, here's one with a, you know, a chronic case that we reconstructed, very unstable on the left there. Uh, and once you've done the reconstruction, very stable on the right. So that's the technique we've been using for a while and we're just in the process of doing the biomechanics uh, and we should have that published hopefully reasonably soon. So in summary, for acute AC joint, really the four and the five and the overgrown three, um, less than three weeks. Uh, I know you saw some, some stuff in the previous talk about using dog bone for the chronics. If you're going to do that, you're doing a big soft tissue repair at the same time. I like the tightrope, it's very, very simple. You can do it as an open technique very, very easily. Um, and then you decide whether you need to brace. Personally, for me, in a lot of the more acute situations, if you repair the envelope, it's going to heal. You don't need to add more tissue to it because you're not gonna get them moving too early anyway. It's only the ones that are grossly unstable with a lot of soft tissue damage, uh, so that more the fours and the fives. Uh, that I the, the big fours and fives that I think I need to do that for, but not that many. Um, a couple of cases just to sort of show you the sort of thing we talk about. Um, here's a 25 year old male. This is a very obvious grade five. There's a lot of uh, soft tissue damage there, um, and all you see here is tightrope that nicely reduced. Uh, you'll see in the picture on the left. We're nicely at the base of the coracoid, and we're nicely in the middle of the clavicle. Um, so that's a fairly straightforward case. I didn't do anything to the uh, AC joint on that one because it was very acute. It's healed up nicely, no problems in the long term. Here's an interesting one, just to sort of make it slightly different for you. 30-year-old male, fell out of skiing, did a lot of those. No obvious injury on the first x-rays. 
but he said that the thing felt unstable. Didn't feel right to him. It clunked and it moved. Uh, and so somebody organised a, a weight-bearing film, which we don't normally do, and clearly there's something wrong. But even there, it doesn't look too horrible. Probably a three. Um, but there is a hint of something wrong. If you then get the axial, if you look carefully, you can see that whether you call this a 3B <clears throat> or whether you call it a 4, I think it's academic. It's clearly that he's got AP instability of that joint. Um, so we put that one back together. And again, it didn't actually do uh, anything to the AC joint there, uh, but he's come back nice and stable as well. This one, again, uh, feels unstable. And if you look at this, this is often gets missed by the trauma surgeons. That joint isn't right. It doesn't look particularly high, but it's wide. And when you get the uh, axial view, you can see quite clearly there, again, it's gone posteriorly. And that's the clue when you start out uh, that the joint doesn't look quite normal. And I apologise for the quality of this picture. It was taken off the screen because I couldn't do anything else. Uh, it looks a bit weird, but you get the idea that it works. Yes. So that's my experience and my thoughts on these. I've seen some questions popping up. Um, so we'll try and go through some of those. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Prof. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mute the line. I see there's some interference there. Just give me a second. Oh. Okay, so I've just muted all, and um, if I can ask um, Professor Duncan, Tennant, and Shresh Kajar to just unmute themselves, that would be fantastic, um, so that we can take on some of these questions. Just before we do so, I do want to let all the participants know that this is a series, the coffee room is a series, and we have some scheduled meetings throughout the month of April and May. Tomorrow we'll be addressing the flat foot, um, and we're grateful for Dr. Luke Chanelli and Dr. Mohammed Nasser from Egypt um, for their time tomorrow. And here, as you can see, is the schedule throughout the month of April and May. So reach out to your technology consultants to understand more about how to join these meetings. We'll be utilizing this platform and also YouTube. If you've not subscribed, I strongly encourage you to do so. You can receive notifications there. Okay, shall we move over to some questions? Um, Duncan, I'm not sure if it's possible for you to put your camera on so we can see you. And, I, and I seriously, I'll... Yeah, perfect. I'm so I'll, I, I want to. I want to thank you. I know you're working on the front line at the moment as well, um, and for taking your time out. Um, sincerely appreciate it. So um, one question from um, Dr. Khalid is, do you think that type four and five associated more or less um, have some impact on the biomechanics of the sternoclavicular joint immediately? So if we start off with Dr. Gajar, um, do you believe that type four and five have some sort of impact on the biomechanics of the sternoclavicular joint immediately? Yeah, obviously, uh, because the shoulder girdle works as a unit, so there will be certainly uh, problems with regards biomechanics, and hence the need to address these injuries surgically. Professor? Um, I think it's, it's it's an interesting one with the sternoclavicular joint, that in theory, yes, it will have an impact on the, on the sternoclavicular joint. In practice, we don't see it. I I have got a big sternoclavicular practice and I don't have people coming in following AC joints, whether they are treated or not treated, then complaining that they're having sternoclavicular pain. Uh, so I think in theory, yes. I think in practice, probably not as much as we think it should. Sure. Um, another question is with regards to stem cells. So, Prof, over to you first. And what do you make of stem cell therapy? Do you think there is a place for it in AC joint surgery, um, given the soft tissue augmentation that you're going to do in that space as well? The short answer is no. At the moment, I don't think it has a place. Um, and I know I may get into trouble for, for saying this. Um, 
when we do these injuries acute, we're looking for biological healing, and there's plenty of it because there is trauma. Things are trying to heal. So I don't think we need to chuck anything extra in. Uh, my personal feeling on stem cells at the moment is that we're not quite there in understanding the, uh, the pharmacology of stem cells so that we know they're important. We know that lots of these growth factors and various other things are necessary, but they're a cascade. And until we can work out which ones are important at what stage in the healing, just chucking soup at it and hoping that something will stick, um, I think we're being a bit optimistic. So I don't think that if you do the operation right, there's any benefit in adding stem cells to it at the moment. And Dr. Gajar, is there something that you do, biology, no, incorporated? No experience, in and uh, I don't know whether it has a role for uh, this type of injuries. Okay. Well, guys, we certainly see biology um, becoming more and more accepted. And as you guys have correctly stated, maybe it is something that needs to be studied further to understand if it does have any impact, especially where AC joint is concerned. Um, do you believe there is any role of a conservative management of a type 3B dislocation? Um, Dr. Kajar, to you first. Uh, yeah, of course, for sure. If he's not an athlete or a manual laborer or into any high demand uh, activity. So uh, as shown in the algorithm in my presentation, it would be a trial of uh, non-operative management for, say, around 6 to 12 weeks if the patient uh, experiences pain on scapular dyskinesia, or the so-called sick scapular syndrome, then he would be offered a candidate for surgery. Also, it's very important to understand from the available literature, and there is a systematic review uh, published two years ago which says that if you were to operate, if you operate them early, then you ensure a better outcome than delaying surgery and of operating them late. So, you know, you need to really keep a close eye on these patients. Not everyone needs surgery, especially the type 3s. But if so, you offer them surgery early. Professor? Yeah, I, you've got to take it on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Um, if I operate early, then they're out of their sports, potentially out of work uh, for a number of weeks. Um, I mean, I, I have a lot of rugby players, and I say to them, well, as soon as you're pain-free, you can go back and play rugby. And, you know, that's usually about two weeks for them. So we can deal with the consequences later if we need to. Um, the cyclists quite often can get back on the bike with quite an unstable AC joint and it doesn't bother them. Uh, my colleague has a grade five on one side and a grade four on the other, both of which he's elected to treat conservatively. So I wouldn't say that you absolutely have to have an operation on anything. Uh, I talk to all the patients and let them make up their minds. And it's often difficult on day one because they're in shock, they're in pain, they don't know what to do. But you've got a couple of weeks to think about it. Um, I warn them that a grade five, they're highly likely to have something done. But I say my colleague's now, I think he's 10 years out from both sides. And he said it bubbles him occasionally, but not enough to want an operation. So take them on a case by case basis knowing that there is evidence out there, but I, I don't think there's a big problem with leaving them. Sure. Prof, a question specifically for you, for Dr. Mishani, is how do you bail out if the coral cord fractures during the procedure? And what's your opinion about twin tail as opposed to single tie rope or dog bone? Um, going back, I'll do the, the second part first. I don't see that there's any advantage to the twin tail over the tight rope. Uh, Andreas Imhoff published his data on the uh, his one-year results of the twin tail at the same time as we published our two-year results of the tightrope, a single tightrope, and all my outcome scores were better than his. So I would say <laughs> don't bother with the twin tail. It makes it a lot more difficult, no advantage. Dog bone over tightrope, the theoretical advantage, slightly lower profile. It's a thicker suture slightly smaller holes. <clears throat> I'm not sure that anybody's ever done the comparison to say one is better than the other. Um, you take your pick, really. Uh, I don't know that I would get them any, going any quicker on a dog bone. Um, so it's a personal preference there. 
Um, and I forgot the other half of the question already. Coracoid fracture. Yeah, coracoid fractures and bailouts. Um, um, what would be your bailout? I think if you manage to fracture the coracoid, and that's usually because you've had multiple goes at uh, drilling it, um, you're in trouble because you haven't got anything to fix it to. Now, open, you can go deeper and deeper into the scapula. Uh, and you can get right down into the base, so you can get around the coracoid fracture. Arthroscopically, it's quite hard to get a jig all the way back there. So I've never had it happen because I've always been absolutely meticulous about making that hole. And I think, as you saw, you can get away with one hole if it's a little bit lateral. If you've drilled two holes in it, you're in trouble. Um, so I don't know how you get out of a coracoid fracture. Just don't go there in the first place is the answer. Chaps, um, there's been a lot of questions based around the knotless peg button that's being utilised with the clavicle plate. Have any of you got any of experience of that as, with a push-through technique? Um, I've not got experience of the, the peg button, but it's roughly the same size as the tightrope. Um, so you can do it either way. Um, the push-through technique, I would do it, I've, I've used the sort of the one on a stick, you've then got to line up your drill holes exactly the same and you've got to try and deliver this rigid thing through two drill holes, which is not easy, uh, particularly around a fracture. Whereas when we do it around a fracture, I pass it through the clavicle plate and the clavicle and then pass it through the, the coracoid as a separate step uh, in the way I showed you. And personally, I would do it that way. It's much, much easier. Sure. And, and for fracture coracoid? Thought about that technology, so using a peg button with a dog bone on top, is that something that you would consider for a coracoid, coracoid fracture? fracture? Yeah. Um, coracoid fracture, depending on where it is, um, if it's the tip of the coracoid, you can ignore it. If it's the base of the coracoid, uh, then I actually put um, a screw or two straight down the neck of the coracoid into the body of the scapula. It's a completely different process. Uh, but if it's just the tips come off, you don't need to bother. When we did uh, shoulder replacements a million years ago, you used to oste osteotomize the tip of the coracoid and suture it back on. Always fell off. No downside. Sure. Don't worry. Shresh, yourself, any, any, do you have any experience of that? So no, use, no experience with the use of the peg button. Regards the uh, question on the coracoid fracture, obviously it's, going, it's a nightmare situation. And uh, as uh, Prof said, that if at one or two attempts you're not able to get to the coracoid, if one is doing an arthroscopic approach, then I would strongly recommend that you abandon the arthroscopic portion and you do an open procedure to make sure that at your third attempt you get into the coracoid to uh, try and avoid this nightmare complication. But if at all it happens, if possible, fix it with a screw. Uh, but otherwise, um, it, it, it is a very, very difficult uh, scenario to deal with, really. Okay, chaps, I have another question from South Africa. We've got time for two more questions, um, unfortunately. So from Dr. Molpo from South Africa, in acute ACJ requiring CC repair, when do you do internal bracing? What guides your decision to doing bracing? So if we ask um, Dr. Suresh Gajar first. Yeah, sure. So I, I think this was asked uh, previously, but I'll repeat the answer again is that typically from these uh, anatomic and biomechanical studies, what we've learned in the last decade is that the 3B and higher injuries have much more forces. And if you were to improve outcomes to try and achieve uh, a good function, then you need to address the AC joint. So, you know, I would, I would add that component of uh, the internal bracing for all injuries from 3B and above if I'm offering surgery to the patient. Professor? Um, in my chronic cases, I will do some form of augmentation in all of them. Uh, in the acute cases, quite often with the lower grade, with, with the three Bs and the fours, you can close the soft tissue envelope up again, uh, and it heals quite nicely. Uh, in the fives, I think quite often there's too much soft tissue damage, uh, and I, I worry about its healing potential, so I'll do an augment. But it is purely an augment. It is just there to allow 
everything to stay in the right place while it heals. Uh, so you're not relying on it for long-term reinforcement. It's not going to work. It, it is only Kevlar at the end of the day. Sure. Gentlemen, one last question to both of you, and we'll go with Prof first. So, Prof, would you recommend the use of MRI, CT for your type 5, type 6 to assess muscular ligamentous injury? Is it something that you routinely call for? Well, the type 6 is, is completely different. Um, you know, type 6 is a major neurovascular injury. Um, so they get full trauma workup. Uh, they probably end up with a, an MR angio or a CT angiogram. Um, but this is, that's all done as an emergency. They quite often have root avulsions. Um, that's a different beast. Um, my routine workup for these, to be honest, is, is simply x-ray. I get, an, get the x-rays, you make the diagnosis. You know that the ligaments have all gone. So there's no advantage to MRI to see if the ligaments have gone. But I was saying, I, my attitude to the glenohumeral joint is that I will come back to it later. And very, very rarely do they come back complaining of a problem. Um, my personal feeling is that a lot of the problems that we see are not relevant or they're old problems uh, and we can deal with them later. So I, I don't treat anything else acutely, so I don't bother MRIing them acutely. But it doesn't change my management. Thanks. Dr. Gijal? Uh, wish well in my setup. Uh, what happens is that generally the patient uh, comes to me with an MRI which is already being done. So most sure. of the times I really don't have a choice in the decision making. But uh, what Prof. Tennant is saying is a, a very, very rational approach. Uh, and I know in the National Health Service there are certain waiting periods and certain restrictions. But uh, in these high uh, level injuries, uh, if they come primarily to me, I wouldn't hesitate to get an MRI done. Uh, it's one of the reasons is that, you know, I'm spoiled uh, with choices in my practice and it really has an important role to play. So certainly I would get one MRI done. Brilliant. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we're going to have to call it there. Um, it's been a wonderful session. So many questions coming in and it's been fantastic to see almost 400 delegates join us both on Microsoft Teams and YouTube. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think it just goes to show that, you know, we all continue to be stimulated and engaged with medical education during these challenging times. So again, I just want to inform you guys that there will be an extensive um, schedule from Arthrex throughout the month of April and May. I strongly encourage you to register to our YouTube channel for further updates. Um, I also encourage you to speak to your local technology consultant, let them know your details should you wish to receive an e-invite so that you can join us on MS Teams as well. So on this slide here, it will show you the schedule going forward and we're happy to circulate this um, once we have your contact details. So once again, I want to take this opportunity to thank Professor Duncan Tennant. Thank you very much for taking time out from the front line and joining us here today. I know you've had to call in the, the, the cavalry there. Um, and Dr. Shreyesh Gijar, thank you very, very much indeed. Gentlemen, it's been a wonderful opportunity to engage and learn about experiences from different parts of the world. And I think this is what this platform is truly about is engaging and connecting surgeons from all corners of the world. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing the rest of you back on tomorrow um, for the Flatfoot session. Thank you. Thanks, Ali, Avish, thank and Prof Tennant, and all the best to everyone in the UK. Brilliant. Thanks thank you. Stay Thanks well. again. Much for now. Thank, thank you. you. Stay, stay safe. Away. Thank you, Prof. I will Bye. stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye.